Thank you so much for joining us. We know this word will significantly impact your life. So let's tune in. Amen, amen. Well, it is my honor to be here tonight. You may be seated this evening. We just love your pastor, the staff here, and all of you. Wow, what a great attendance tonight on a Wednesday night. God has something special for us, doesn't he? Well, you know the rules. If you say amen a lot, you get out earlier. <laughs> it's just kind of the way it works. <laughs> I am so blessed to be here. I really am. I'm looking forward to tonight. I, my, my intention was to get with Pastor Marco tomorrow and just spend some time. We want to talk about some endeavors that are coming up in this coming year. And, and then he asked me to minister tonight, and I, I immediately felt blessed and knew exactly what God wanted me to say. So we're going to get right into it tonight so we can make it to the Dairy Queen before they close. <laughs> you know, I remember planting churches and telling my young pastors to preach with passion, preach with purpose, preach like it, it's your last opportunity to speak a word to those people. I would tell them, remember where you came from and where you're going. Then time went by, and I know most of you know my testimony, I got very sick. I was sick with liver cancer for many years, and, and there's nothing like sitting across a desk from a doctor, and the doctor looking at you when you're 92 pounds of weight, you feel sick, you're full of fever, you're just, you're just emaciated, and the doctor telling you you have three months to live. There's nothing like that. I remember that moment. I remember that moment. We have actually, in America, set aside a day that we look back to remember. And that day, we call it Memorial Day. Memorials are built around challenging and painful moments in history where certain individuals have risen above those moments. So we build a memorial, we build a statue, we make a marker to remember that moment. Memorials are unique moments in life that end up defining us. Usually it comes because of the crashing together of a tragedy and of somebody's heroism rising to the moment. All of us in here, in this room, have memorials. Things that we look back on, memories, markers in our lives. Whether they were intentional or not, they were big moments and they marked us and we remember them. Sometimes we carry those moments with us, and sometimes we carry many of those moments with us because they shaped our past, but I want to say to you that they now create your future. There are markers that you look back on as you try to move forward. There are things you remember as you press into your future. Perhaps you are like me today. When you look back, Sometimes those memorials, those markers, left you feeling orphaned. They left you feeling dis disparaging. They left you feeling uncertain of yourself. Rather than provoking the best in you, they actually inspired a negative feeling. And if you struggle tonight with brokenness, or you struggle tonight with a sense of being abandoned by somebody that you loved and gave your heart to, or maybe tonight you have a sense of emptiness or you feel inadequate or unable or you're not even sure of your assignment with God. I challenge you to look at your memorials. Memorials are things in your past that are informing you of your identity. That is what memorials do. They tell you who you are. But I have great news for you tonight. You can choose to have new memorials. You can choose to create a new memorial. Part of the process of creating a different future is to choose different memorials to look back on. I'm going to let you think about that for a moment. Memorials you can look back on that empower you, that will shape your future, that will define who you really are. I'll give you an example. I can remember certain altar calls where the presence of God changed my life. Where I knelt down, it, was, it wasn't just like any other altar call for some reason or whatever was happening in my life. At that moment, there was a power encounter with God that shaped my heart that I can still look back at that altar call and remember God touching me there. 
I remember who prayed for me, and sometimes I've even written it in notes of what God spoke to me at those particular moments. They're memorials, they're markers, they're things I look back at that I can remember to help me face my future and press into what God has for me. When you enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't sometimes realize it, but you're also entering into a relationship with the church. When you first come to church, perhaps you didn't understand all the liturgy. You didn't understand why we sang three songs, did an offering, gave announcements, sang another song, had a preach. You didn't understand all that stuff. It didn't even matter to you. What you felt was somebody accepting you. You felt somebody loving you, somebody being kind to you. You felt like you could be part of this family, this group. It was like a tribe that you could be a part of. That's the way I felt. I walked into a little church. There was a little group of people and suddenly I felt accepted. It didn't matter if I was a drug addict and wasted. I felt like they loved me, they, they cared and, and I felt like I could be a part of that and I was accepted there. And, 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 and so as time went on and time passed by, I began to meet more and more people in the church. And a lot of the times, can I just be honest tonight? A lot of those people had very negative experiences with the church. And so I would start to hear them talk about their negative things. And so I would try to talk about Jesus and then they would bring up the church. I'd say, wait, wait, we're not talking about the church. We're talking about Jesus. And they would bring up, yeah, but, but you know, the church hurt me and the church did this and the church did that. And I don't know if it was intentional or not, but I found myself trying to help people see Jesus without looking through the church because the church was a negative memorial. The church was a negative marker in many people's lives. And I didn't know how to get past that negative thing that had happened in their lives in the church and bring to them Jesus. I couldn't figure out how to tell them about Jesus without talking about the church. Then as time went on, let's be honest, I started to get hurt by the church. Different things happened, preachers let me down, this went on, that went on, and it became more and more difficult. Then after a few more years, I began to have all my friends start saying things like, well, I'm all about Jesus, but I don't need the church. As if they'd elevated above the need for God's church. And so suddenly, I realized that, that I, I was in a, a strange place because I loved Jesus, but I was struggling with the church. So tonight, I want to take a few moments and I want to talk to you about the church. I want to talk to you honestly about my uncomfortableness with the church. I want to also talk to you about my desperate need for the church. And I want to talk to you about the desperate need we have to be committed to the church just like we're committed to Jesus. The church was not our idea. It was Jesus' idea. Even the word the church, the language of that was the language that Jesus used. He said, I will build my church upon this rock and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And, and we've taken that word, the church, and somehow over time we've corrupted it, we've destroyed the language of it, we've made it sound horrible, we've given it a bad reputation. And honestly, I went through a season in my life where I didn't even want to be called the church. So in my title of our, our, our churches, it would be New Be- and there's nothing wrong with just having this, but I put New Beginnings and I took the word church off. I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to put church up there. And then we had Sun Life. And I didn't want the word church on there because I didn't want to be associated with a church. And at the same time, I was a pastor of a church. It was a weird moment. And then there was a season that I became uncomfortable with be- being called pastor. I would get around business people or get around doctors or professors or city councilmen or whatever. They would introduce me as Pastor Ray. And for some reason, that was uncomfortable to me because I associated with that negative memorial of the church. And so I tell them, no, I'm just Ray. I'm just Ray. They started announcing me as, this is just Ray. (laughs) Then I found myself in a strange place and people started calling me Apostle Ray. And that was even weirder. And, And even to this day sometimes that language is a little bit strange to me to be called Apostle Ray or pastor Ray. So here I am, the pastor of a church. That's a double negative in one sentence. 
I didn't want to be either one. I didn't want to be a, a noticed as pastor. I didn't want to be called church. And, and yet here I am. It's, it, it just felt like whenever they announced you, here's Pastor Ray. It's almost like here's a cannibal coming to the party to eat you. It just felt weird. And so I remember a lot of my young pastors came to me. They said, Pastor, you've got to allow us to call you pastor. You've got to allow us to call you apostle. And I said, why? I, I don't even understand why I have to do that. And they said, because if you would own that identity, there would be some amazing young people that would aspire to come into those same things. And if you won't own it, then nobody can aspire to it. You've got to learn to own it so other people can look and say, yes, I want to be that. Yes, I want to go there. Yes, I want to do that. And so I, I'm saying to you today, church, that when you recognize a man or a woman by the title pastor or doctor or apostle or prophet, whatever it might be, those things establish value and they establish honor. And you'll never see a miracle in the Bible anywhere that did not have value and honor attached to it. Every, when they did not value Jesus or honor him, there was no miracles done there. And so you have to have those things. But at the same time, you can't force people to do it. I can't come to you and say, call me Pastor Ray. Because the moment I do that, it's counterproductive. It has to be something that comes from your heart, something that comes from your spirit, something that you recognized. Now I'm going somewhere tonight. I am convinced that God wants to do incredible things in the earth. But perhaps somehow we're holding him back. Because sometimes we're individuals that go to church rather than a tribe that become the church. Are you all right? I've had a coming out moment. Can I tell you, we are the church. We are the church. We are doing what Jesus initiated. It was important to him. It was so important to him that he died on a cross for it. So I want to read to you tonight an eruption in human experience where the church becomes the most significant force in the world. I want to read out of 1 Thessalonians 1, a passage that God spoke to me that I believe will really touch your hearts tonight. Verse 1, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I love how that letter is constructed because it gives us insight into how God is working in the world. Have you ever taken a promise out of the scripture? Like by, by his stripes I'm healed. And you start to quote that promise over and over. And you begin to claim that promise. That's my promise. That's my promise. That's my promise. God, do it just like you said. That's my promise. And then after a while, you find out that it's not working. Now listen to me carefully. I do believe that God knows each and every one of us individually. I believe he knows the numbers on some of your heads. Some of them he has a hard time counting because there's none. The hairs on your head. But God knows you. He knows the very hairs on your head. He knows everything about you. And I believe God loves you as a person. But perhaps sometimes we have corrupted the narrative of the scripture. Thinking that the promise is to us as individuals rather than to us as a community, as a tribe, as a church. The Bible should be read from we first before it's read from me first. The promises are for us, not just I. That promise is, if the promise is good for Ray Ray, it's good for all of y'all too. It's for all of us. It's not just for me. And so when I read the scripture, if I place it in the right place, it helps me to understand how God is working in the earth. It starts off Paul, Silas, and Timothy. In other words, it's a team. This scripture, this text was not written by Paul alone, but Paul used a team of people to work together. God can do marvelous things in and through each and every one of us, but it pales into insignificance in comparison to what God can do through all of us together. 
Am I making sense? I'm not hearing a lot of amens. Paul was powerful by himself. Paul was uh, uh, incredible. He actually shook the entire Roman Empire. The Bible says he just literally turned the world upside down. He did that without Silas and without Timothy. Why, why would he share this passage? Why would he put their names on it? Why not just brand it, the apostle Paul says? Why not just make it all about him? Why not just take all the credit for himself? I believe that it's something important here that Paul and the Holy Spirit wants us to see. That it wasn't just a one-man show, but it was a team of men working together, almost in relational things like the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. It was showing the relational nature of God. God is a God of relationship. God is a God of community. And there's a lot of things you can do in your life alone, but I want to tell you something. When you commit yourself to your own personal greatness, you've committed yourself to smallness. Although we sit together, many times we're not walking together. Perhaps the most powerful thing God wants to do in the world is not just through me as an individual, but through us as a church. Amen. Perhaps the most powerful thing God has for all of us is not just us, but all of us. Somehow, we live as if the church is about ourself. And we make the promises all about ourself. That what we want God to do is for me, rather than what God wants to do is for all of us. And so maybe you have to learn this tonight. If you'll step into community, if you'll step into the church, if you'll step into a team, there is a promise that's far greater than the promise you'll receive by yourself. There's an impact and an impartation and an influence and something powerful that God can do far greater if we work together than if we work alone. There's something powerful. Now listen, I, I just, just for the sake of being uh, politically correct, this could have been Mary, Martha, and Suzanne. It didn't have to be Paul, Silas, and Timothy. It could be Chewy. <laughs> Never mind. God is looking for people who will lay down their egos, lay down their pride, lay down their brand, lay down their name, and come together to do something great for his namesake. That's what God's looking for. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church. Everybody say to the church. We skip over that because we think it's just an introduction. It's just him getting started. Now here's my uncomfortable moment for, for I spent a lot of years trying to reclaim the reputation of Jesus. I wanted people to see Jesus for who he was. But to do that, I had to almost strip away the damage that we had done because we carry his name, but not his character. And because we're not carrying his character in his heart, and we're not really showing love, we're just doing stuff, there was something that was violated in the memorials in people's hearts. And somehow I was having a hard time getting back past that. So I would be up front about Jesus, but I tended to throw the church to the basement. I was almost ashamed to be associated with her. Yet the entire time, I was a pastor of a church. As God began to help me to see this, I began to think back on all the great things God has done in my life. Really, I've been to over 100 different nations of the world. I've spoken to kings and queens. Now, I'm not trying to brag, I'm just telling you what God did with a guy that cheated to get through high school. I've been all around the world. I have, I have, I could tell you story after story of, of miracles and demon possessed people being set free and even my own liver cancer being healed and hep C being healed. I could, I could go on and on. But it dawns on me that nothing I've ever done or accomplished has been outside of community. I've spent my life trying to hone the craft of communication, just as your pastor has. It's not like we just get up here and wing this out. 
We've spent hours in preparation to stand before you and bring a word that you can understand in a way that you can apply it to your life. It's not accidental if you understand the message. It's, it's because there's a lot of work. So if I preach a sermon, the truth is it only has value if somebody hears it. And it only has value if the person hearing it can actually apply it to their life and let it shape their life. So if I was in here tonight preaching and there was nobody in here, this sermon would fall on nothing. So I'm really nothing without you. My sermon is nothing without you. Without you, we really can't do anything. And I suspect that was God's intention all along that our greatest contributions in life would emerge when we give ourselves to one another. Can I hear an amen? amen. Sounded like a Presbyterian church tonight. You and I together impacting the world. God never intended on us to do it all alone. God started this text out saying it's, it's about a team and it's talking to a group of people, a church. And that's what a church is. It's everybody moving together in concert. It doesn't mean that you have to be part of the paid staff. It just means that you can be a doctor, an architect, a barista. You can be a plumber, a carpenter. You might even be in between jobs. But wherever you're at, you're supposed to be on a mission together for Jesus Christ. Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church, now watch this, of the Thessalonians. So the church was for a city called Thessalonica, Thessalonica. In other words, this church doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to Pastor Marco. It doesn't belong to Ray. It belongs to San Bernardino. The church belongs to the people of the city. Somehow we think the church is here and it's supposed to be for us. That's a very skewed perspective. I go to church because of what I get out of it, because of what my kids get out of it. The true church is a church that is here for the city that it's in. The church is not here for us. We are the church, but we're here for the world. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So we have to learn to redefine the value of a church. Every city I go into, it seems now, they're rezoning the city to block churches. And I know they're doing it over tax reasons and all that, but honestly, when you get right down to it, they don't see any value in a church. The church isn't doing anything for the city. Well, I thank God that this church is, amen. This city is beginning to understand that we're not here all about ourselves trying to be something great, but we are here as servants for the city. We are here to serve the city and love the city and help the people, amen. What could be more powerful than starting a foster care after age for after age kids? Those kids that turn 18 years old, all their lives they've been abused and abandoned and left alone and sexually uh, assaulted, all kind of things. Then at 18, they get thrown on the streets. How powerful is it that your church is going to come together and reach out and pick those kids up? How powerful is that? That's what a church is. That's what a church does. He says to the church of Thessalonians, to the church of the Ephesians, to the church of the Galatians, to the church of the Samberdu. <laughs> Amen. Jesus speaks in back, macro and in micro. In other words, big and small. Listen to what he said. Listen to, listen to what Jesus said. I want you to catch this now. When he's talking to the church, not talking to individuals, he's talking to us as a church. He says, you're gonna be my witnesses to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. That's macro, macro to the entire planet. I want the church at San Berdu to be a witness to the entire planet. But I also want her to be a witness to Samaria. That's to people that we don't even know about yet. We don't really love them. And then I also want you to be to Judea. That's the outer regions. 
That's to those people you don't even want to like. Amen. He says, I want you, but here's what I want you to see. The smallest unit that Jesus uses is the city. I want you to be a witness to the city. He didn't say to Joe or to Joe's family or to your friends. He said the smallest unit, the smallest denominator that I, I see this church the way touching is the city. From there it gets larger and larger and larger. I think sometimes churches, and I thank God it's not here, but I, I just want to put this in your spirit. Sometimes churches think so small that we only think of ourselves. The smallest unit that Jesus spoke about to the church was a city. You can do more than just the city, but he said you gotta start with the city. Then I want you to spread bigger and bigger until you're touching the entire planet. Amen. Jesus said to do this, and he spoke these words to us before we had the internet, before we had Google. All we had, listen to what he says. Here's, here's how you do it. All you have is the power of love, faith, and hope. Here's what he said. Your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he goes on to say this in verse four. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering. How many of you know San Bernardino has had some suffering as a city? With the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. And so you became a model to all believers. All over San Bernardino, Pomona. And the Lord's message rang out from you not only by, not only in San Bernardino and Pomona, but your faith in God has become known everywhere. Can you imagine, wait a minute church, can you imagine that God writes you a letter and it says your faith has been known everywhere, everywhere. Now we're just getting started here, I promise you. I thank God that this church is a church of evangelism, amen. I thank God that you're gonna go out there and you're gonna take the night with the light, amen. I thank God for those things. But there's a lot of churches that, that, that nobody, if you go down to the mall and you ask, have you ever heard of that church? They've never heard of it. They don't know that they're loved by God. They don't know that anybody cares. They don't even know we're here yet. And yet, our faith is supposed to be known around the world. So I wanna prophesy to you a little bit, just prophetically speak to you for a moment. I believe within the next five years that this church will be known around the world. Around the world. The other day, some called me from Europe to tell me about a time that, that, that they were in Central America. And in Central America, they saw me and they came to America, to my church in, 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 in America, and they gave their heart to Christ, and now they've gone down to South America. So here's a person that came from Europe to Central America to America and now to South America, and I believe that God is capable of doing such things as that right here in this house that God will bring people from other nations of the world. That's right. And that you'll have an effect in places you've never heard of or thought about. Can I tell you something about Latino people? You do really good with Russian people. No, I know, I know you don't understand that, but you have an affinity there that they will hear your voice. They will hear you. There's something that they will respond to you. God can open up the nations of the world to this church right here. God can cause things to happen that you've never even really entertained in your mind. But I'm telling you in the next five years, I believe God's gonna take some of you right here, men and women, and gonna place you around the world. And not only that, he's gonna influence people from around the world are gonna come here. Japanese, Koreans, Australians, people from New Zealand, Russia, uh, people from Poland, they're all gonna come here. 
to hear what God is doing and to see the model that you have set before them. There's going to be a model in this house that they're going to hear and they're going to see. There's people all over the world right now that need a way world outreach. You got to be generous. You can't just keep it to yourself. You got to share it with the city and then you got to share it with the world. Amen. God wants to share that. And I believe that you're capable of reaching much further than you've ever dreamed of. I believe God has a plan for some of you. And I know some of you think you're too old. Hey, man, I'm getting ready to hire everybody that's over 65 so I don't have to pay insurance no more. Amen. Let me tell you something. Some of you gray hairs are just getting ready to go right now. God could use your wisdom. God could use your insight. God could use your life if you would let him do it. Don't put yourself so small that it's all about you and your grandbabies. God has something great for you. God has a plan for your life, and God has a plan for this church. Somebody shout amen. Now, I know that there's churches all over the place. But that does not mean that people are hearing the message of Jesus in a way that makes any sense to them. There are churches on every corner that are so filled with negative memorials, negative markers, that people can't relate to them. But we need to go in there and we need to establish a new marker, a new memorial, a people that love people, a people that are filled with hope and faith that we initiate and we believe God to meet their needs. As your pastor was speaking earlier, where we go in and we, we feed them and we love them and we help them and we, we do whatever we can do. I have planted churches in nightclubs. We used to go in there on Saturday night after they was done. We would put on rubber gloves because we was picking up hypodermic needles, needles, mattresses, and other things. And we would clean it all up so that the next morning we could have church. Amen. And before long, that nightclub was filled up with people. Amen. They wouldn't have come to a regular established establishment, but the nightclub felt like home. So we taught them about Jesus. We trained them about Jesus. And in the end, they never even understood it, but they had become a tribe. They had become a church. And it was filled with love for their neighborhood. I believe that God wants us to model things from this house. As we press into the downtown, the, the, the work we have downtown in San Bernardino, what a model for other churches to see. What a model for them to see. You guys are getting ready to go on a, it's crazy. Your pastor's telling me about on a nighttime evangelism thrust into San Berdu, which is considered the most violent city of all there is in, in California. I love the idea that you're going to set tents up on corners and have preachers out there preaching in the night about the love of God. What a powerful thing. What a model for other churches to see. That's what evangelism is all about. We're not trying to set a trend. We're not trying to be cool. We're trying to reach people. Amen. When you go first, like your pastor did, he shared with you tonight. He shared from his heart. When you go first, you usually don't get the glory. You get the suffering, the no paycheck, the weeping, the crying, the wondering what's next. Later, when everybody comes in here and sees this, they go, wow. But what they don't realize is the price that was paid to get here. But that price is small if we can get one soul saved. Amen. Motivated by love, telling people that Jesus loves them. Are you with me tonight? We don't want to ride on the momentum of the past. What we want to do is build healthy memorials that we can look at and say, yes, we are able. We are overcomers. Like, like the, the, the young man that was up here tonight. We are overcomers. We can go somewhere. We can take the land. We can advance into the future because we love our city. Everybody else can talk trash about our city, but we love our city. We love our people, and, and they might be the furthest from God, but they're prime candidates for God. Oh, amen. This church was never created just to survive. 
You weren't here just to survive, just to get by. You are called, listen to me, God has breathed upon you to become the most innovative, creative, inspiring, uh, can do anything to reach people. Church, amen. You're a people that are a part of something that's bigger than you. You're a part of something that's big enough to reach a city and reach beyond the city and even into Pomona. Maybe one of these days into Tijuana. Maybe that, hey, I could start going off, man. I started thinking about cities you could go to. Ecuador, oh man, you could go to Ecuador, Peru. Ooh, I could see some of you preaching in Peru. 5,000 people in front of you as you're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in Peru. Amen. Now listen to me. I know I'm talking big tonight, and I'm almost done. But I believe you're called to be that church. You're supposed to reach out beyond yourself. It's bigger than you. And if you fail, if you fail in the process, so be it. At least when you fail, let there be bloody skid marks in the direction that you're supposed to be going. Amen. At least be pressing that direction. And you know, people always ask me, Pastor, just tell us it's God. If you'll say it's God, then we'll do it. I'm always tempted to lie. Just one little lie won't hurt them. Yes, it's God. But I don't, listen to me, I'm going to give you a shocker right here. I don't know. I don't know if God's going to breathe on it or not, but I at least know it's the right thing to do. Win souls, press in, believe God, disciple people. And if I crash and burn, bless God, I crash and burn. But I'm going the right direction. I believe in God for the right thing. I'm trying my best, amen. And not every church I plant is going to be a success, but the ones that are, bless God, they're going to have the love of Christ. The Amen. Now, I'm almost done. Listen to this. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction, he said, you became a model for all believers. Man, that's what the church world needs today. It's what the world needs today. The church has become an a epicenter of judgment, and condemnation, and guilt, and shame, and, and abusing power, and abusing people. What we need to do is right now change that memorial. Change that marker so that when our babies, 10 years from now, look back, they see a powerful church, a church moved with conviction, a church that's moved by the word of God. I want to throw out a possibility tonight. I want to say to you that I believe this church can set up a new marker right now. And I believe that in 100 years from now, listen, when they talk about France, when they talk about uh, Paris, they think about it as the city of romance. When they talk about New York City, they think about it as a city of great wealth. When they talk about San Berdu, let's let them think about Jesus and the revival that God brought. Let's let them think about something that's powerful. Amen. Then when they look back, they remember that city because of the move of God, because of the love for people, because of the hope that was inspired. Amen. I believe we can do it. I've looked out there. I've looked at you. You're a motley crew. But I believe God can raise you up. God can do some powerful things. If this message has been a blessing in your life and you would like to show support, please comment, like, share, and subscribe, or click the link below so that you can contribute to our ministry. Thank you and God bless.